So I'm not, uh, so when Brad, I mean, kind of asked me to do this, uh, one of the biggest things, like I said, I've fed growing up southern cattle, northern cattle, and of course, uh, I've seen Charlays pretty, you know, coming up through the years, probably 40 plus years. Uh, and like I said, one of the biggest things is I kind of go through this, and this is going to come from my perspective as being a, a general manager buying the cattle for the company and from what I've seen over the years, the guys I've worked with, the guys that have taught me. Uh, but, the, you know, one of the biggest things I'm asking, like Jake and I are going to kind of do this together because one of the biggest things is we started, I think, I mean, he found uh, a lot of the Charlays that I fed and then it was just establishing the relationships. But one of the biggest and foremost things I can tell anybody from, from a, a feedlot perspective is having the vaccination program. Uh, there's a lot of guys, you know, when they talk about the value, uh, you know, the age and source. For me, one of the biggest added value, added values was the vaccination program. You know, and a lot of the guys that we bought calves off, I mean, when Jason <coughs> called me, that was the number one thing. I didn't care what the cattle were. His vaccination, whether it, it was Pfizer, whether it's Merck, but whoever it was, but it was basically a program, two shots, sometimes three shots. And I know, you know, through the years, as you look at a lot of the cattle, uh, the guys that take them to the cell barn with one shot, there were some guys that give no shots. And there's times of the years, hey, these cattle are bringing the same as these. But over time, I've seen the guys that have stuck with the program consistently, diligently, and faithfully as their calves time after time, year after year, bring the most money. Because for one thing, when you talk about reputable, right, and we're talking about the program's uh, agent sourced is, you get those cattle to the feed yard, you have low death loss, low treatment, is they're gonna go back. You go to the cell bar and buy calves with no shots, one shots, you get it handed to you, guess what? You're not gonna go find those calves next year. You're not gonna seek those calves out. And for me, that was the biggest, biggest piece of the puzzle for me. And you know, growing up on calves, uh, that was the biggest piece is I grew up on a lot of calves that come from the Southeast with no shots with, them. and so I learned the hard way with, uh, on how to take care of them. But in a 70,000 head feed yard, right? The less stress I have, the better off my day's gonna be. And so, getting with Jason and building a plan to, to how we get these calves in and same thing is how many calves can you handle in the feed yard. And it goes to the strategy Cole just talked about is the marketing piece of it. So you have the vaccine, I mean he would, I'd get the cards signed by whatever drug company it was and then I'm not gonna, you know, I've been asked a lot of times which do I like is they're all good, right? I prefer certain medicines over others, vaccines over others. That's my perspective. That's what I see, what I saw on a daily basis. Uh, but for me, is it's just having, sitting down with the vet, the nutritionist and everybody and saying, here's what's best for me. I know cost effectiveness is huge, but it's just, feedlots for me is when you get that piece of paper that's there's three signatures, ranch, vet, and the drug rep, it means a lot and it's listed. And when you see the results from it, uh, you know, there was one year we fed 16,000 calves and we had under 2% death loss. But every single one of them we got, I had a piece of paper on them. And it was a reputable program, vaccine program. Some of them had three shots and we got most of them in October. And that year we fed 70% of them were Charlays from South Dakota and up in that area. Uh, phenomenal year. You know, and so that is the foremost for me when I look at things and, and get these calves in is just the vaccine program. The next piece of it is, you know, when I get the phone call, I got these calves, <coughs> confirmation. My question is how big can I get them? I mean, I'm known for getting cattle big, you know. I like to top heifers 14 to 1500 pounds. I like steers 15 to 1600 pounds. Uh, John will talk in his piece of it. They don't necessarily like it all the time, the packer, but that's that's what I always strive for. So that was my question to Jason all the time: is how big can I get them? Now they might he might look at them when they're 500 pounds. It's the bone. It's and that's one piece about the Charlays that I always I've seen come up over some years. The first picture he showed in 1991 versus 17, right? Is I think I had one of the first calf crops out of Ledger. Phenomenal. I mean, the news would blow up. The ones I fed a lot of them from the 1991 scenario. 
the difference is just the, the explosion I saw in these calves. You know, when I'd ask Jason, what are they going to weigh? He said, you know, I can get these steers 1,600 pounds. Well, the next piece of it is, and this is the all feedlot managers in the United States will sue me for saying this, but it's in their, their job to take your animals and do that, right? Because you can also tell you, if he says it, I can make it 1,200 pounds just as easy. So I, I think there's a lot of that misconception is, uh, and it gets skewed, is once they go to the yard, it's then their job to say, I want to get them to 16, I want to get them to 17. That's what makes it fun. It's not necessarily the, the cow calf producer's fault, but it's our fault over here because sometimes it's just go from point A to point B as fast as we can. So when I look at the confirmation, it's, it's the bone structure. It's And I, I spend a lot of time going with Jason up to the ranchers, talking to them, understanding what they're doing, cow size, what the bulls were. Uh, I mean, I grew up on a cow-calf operation also, Santa Catrudis, bulls and Angus cows. So a whole different scenario in the Texas Panhandle to where I was at in Colorado. Uh, but just getting back into that piece of it is understanding what bulls, what understanding the cows uh, from Montana, Wyoming, South Dakota, Nebraska, a lot of differences in the cows. That gave me an idea of what I could do with them once I got them to the feed garden. Uh, so as we went through it, uh, one thing too is we looked is there's, there's always a tremendous amount of calves that come out. So the question is how many guys can actually handle poly calves versus wean calves? And so with that is I'm going to let Jason kind of talk about the program piece of it and I think we can go through this as an opportunity for the association is, is, and I'll talk about this a little bit later when I talk about the feed them, but knowing the markets, uh, you know, one thing I can say is if a guy could ever figure out how to get a Charlay to where he feeds through the summer, he'll make a lot of money because a Charlay in the summer hands down beats any breed in the world. I mean, they don't have near the heat issues, they don't have the, the heart valves, the AIPs, I saw very, very few, if any, on a Charlotte through the summer. They handle the heat so well. You know, when it's 100 degrees of humidity, I mean, I didn't have near the humidity like there is out here, but they just handle the heat. Um, so if a guy could ever figure out how to calf where his actually went through to where they finished up through the summer instead of black cattle, I think hands down, it would be an advantage. I know everybody has to change it, the way they calf, but uh, you know, even growing up in the Texas Panhandle, when it get as hot as it did, I saw the exact same thing, and that's one thing I've always, I've always seen with the Charlotte breed is going through the summer months is was always a huge plus. But I'll let Jason kind of talk about the programs, because he's out there more than I am. I mean, like I said, he's talking to people, he's seeing the programs where I was kind of at one spot, and I didn't do any of the natural or. Uh, NHTC that was at the other feed yard, so I'll let him kind of talk about that, and I'll just talk about how the Charlotte's fed for me. On the program side of things, um, I think you're seeing more and more obviously of where people want to know where their food's coming from, most importantly. But uh, when I'm out there visiting with, with the feedlot managers, or wherever you're at, uh, they, they don't know where to source. Charlie cattle, just like some producers don't know where to sell them. Everybody's calling them the same page, if you will, that way. Whether you're a bull producer or you're a cow-calf guy, everybody's working for the same end goal to sell your customers' products or your own product. But uh, the program cattle, where I see it, I guess, um, in talking to all these different feedlots and people are looking to get into it, is uh, the traceability is that's that's going to be a huge issue. And what what the Charlotte guys are doing here with this traceability is is important, and I would stress it to to, to your customers. Uh, you know, you look at these younger people in the grocery stores; they're they're looking to see where their food came from. You're looking at people in their 70s; they're paying attention to where this food's coming from. So, back to the value added thing, you're seeing that now. And Cole, you you showed that from Superior on the value added, what, you know, what, what they actually made in addition to commodity cattle. But I think truly going forward in the future, and it might not be this year or five years, whatever it is, but the question you have to ask yourself is what, what am I going to be discounted if I'm not doing those programs? Because the 
it's, it's going to be that important. So, uh, I guess as far as the program panel, that's, that's yet at a premium now, would I want to set a pair and say yes and stay that way forever? I would hope. We'd all hope. But, uh, would I have? Oh, and, and, and one other thing, Judd did talk on the, the, uh, the bull and calf thing. I think another important issue, as far as a, a cow-calf producer goes, if, you know, if you looked at weaning those those cattle, that's going to pay also because these these, you know, these feedlots can only take so many fallen calves. When you've got an NHTC or a natural, and they're running out of help, they can't continue to buy these cattle because they don't have the help. You know, the market gets kind of stagnant. I think a guy looks at weaning some of these cattle yourself and. If you're weeding your heifers to replace, or whatever the case may be. Just, just some thoughts as far as what I'm seeing up from my side of the field. Boots on the ground, okay. <clears throat> so, that'll get finished. So, uh, that was one thing about the weaning piece of it is uh, I think there's a lot of value in that if, if you have the capability to do it. And I think, you know, as we go into this year, you look at you always, everybody looks at the past, right? I mean, and, and it seems the past here lately is just what happened to everybody this last winter. Uh, it's stuck in everybody's mind. Some parts were good, some parts were really bad. The, the question I have is how many guys are actually going to dive into a ball of calf this year? Um, I mean, I'm talking to a lot of guys now that still have their calves on feet. They should be dead, right? Uh, they're going to keep hanging on to them, thinking they're going to keep getting bigger, they're going to get better. Well, it's, they're past that point right now. It's, it's not the cow-calf producer's fault, right? But it's, it's just Mother Nature wasn't very nice to us. So I believe that if you have the opportunity with the hay to go to, like Jason said, look at weaning, I, I think it's going to pay dividends uh, because with the help <coughs> issues that a lot of these guys are faced is I think the value is going to be in it if you can wean them they're going to be more apt to look at that versus going after these bali calves uh, there's only so many guys can handle bali calves and so most most guys I mean same thing in a feed yard setting they want the best so if they're already going into a stressful situation it's going to be tough to get what they want you know for me, another piece of it, and uh, I have nothing against video cell barns, but for me, it was always a branch. Uh, I bought zero head out of cell barn. Number one is I knew the rancher. Jason would introduce me or I'd talk to him. I knew who they were. I knew what they were about. That's what I was doing. That way, and then when I fed them, because if you think about the cell barn setting, as they go to the cell barn, they're probably co-mingled with three other groups. How do you realistically know and they can be thrown with red angus, they can be put with angus, they can be put with anything. How do you know what your cattle did? And I think that's a disadvantage is you realistically don't know, and just like some of the data is, I tried to keep everything I could separate. So if I got eight different ranches in South Dakota, I could tell them all, and I did share a lot of information back with these guys, what their calves actually did. Um, just for improvement reasons and so I could go after them next year. Even if the group did bad, I mean, it could have been my fault too on feeding them. You know, the first year, as I've seen over the last, what, we've got them eight years. Uh, you know, the first year to the last I fed them, I mean, I had a lot of steers pushing five, a lot of heifers pushing over four, and those were on ball and calves. Uh, I tweaked my program to feed them, but there's a lot of value. And for me, it was going, how do I maximize what I'm sending to the plant, right? Because we've got to give that end product to the consumer, which we know they're looking at where they're coming from. They're looking at what they are, what they're fed, hormones, all those kind of things. And so for me is, I was trying to get the best carcass I could. So feeding them different. And that's one thing about the Charlays that I've seen over the years is they do put on a massive carcass. You can feed them to where, from what I've, you know, I saw probably within a five-year period, an average of maybe 82% choice to we were hitting over 90% choice on them. Uh, the, the carcass pounds, we probably put 35 to 40 pounds just on the carcass. And like I said, these were strictly just Charlays in a pen. 
I didn't go mingling. And, and that's the thing is a lot of guys go mingle sort up front, whereas I didn't. And the reason I did that is just so I could see how much carcass I could get on. Uh, you know, there is a disadvantage for us. Or advantage is you, I never saw Charlays having the fours and fives. Uh, and, and I pushed some pretty, pretty, pretty hard, put up some days on them. Uh, you know, 1450, 1460 heifer with a lot of days and fours and fives never got over 20%. So I think the biggest advantage is that people understand that and they feed them to that versus just point A to point B get them gone is there's a lot of value in the Charlay. And like I said, it, it was, and I, it, for me, one of the biggest things was dragging them through the summer. The bet, the, I mean, I would get them in and try to grow them so I could get them through the summer because it's just phenomenal what I saw on, on the blacks and the AIPs, the heartfells, and those kind of issues where the Charlays, I had zero. I mean, I really did. It's, uh, I think that's the advantage just this association has that they can figure out how to market those cattle through that period is I think it'd be a win-win because uh, the heat, the humidity, and g genetically what they're doing, uh, you know, the biggest thing for me was just the choice piece of it is I did have to push on pretty hard to get, to me, to get that choice, which we all know when it's what they do. Uh, you know, I've had, I think the last group I did send, we had 25% CAB. I mean, they get certified they can speak. They're whites. I mean, they're white eyes and smoky shards. You know, it was the smoky black noses, uh, not the pink nosed ones, but they did. So, I mean, before it might have been 5%. So, it, it was a huge positive. And then to see that grow and then get the, the product where, you know, I could, I mean, honestly, I could outdo an Angus carcass wise by 25 or 30 pounds. <coughs> You're going to get the prime and the choice out of the Angus a little bit easier, but you can also get the fours and fives. And I, I just, I went after every Charlay I could, just for that simple fact. Is you can't really ship them early like you could Angus, just for the simple fact to get the choice in them. But the luxury of it was, if I pushed, I pushed on them. So for me, is um, you know, as you, you look at going forward, you look at your options. I think the, the age of source, all those factors are going to play a huge piece in the industry as we go forward. I think it's going to be more traceability and if you can go from, you know, the ranch name, I mean, I think it's going to get to the point where if the ranch name's on the package from wherever it's at, I think it's it's going to be huge. The, the younger generation, I mean, and, you know, when I've seen, when I go shopping, is I'll sit there and it aggravates my wife because I'll sit there and actually watch people when they go to a meat counter. What do they look at? Do they even know what they're looking at? Um, you know, and it's, it's not necessarily the youngest, the younger generation. I think every generation is starting to look at that. Where does product come from? It's vegetables. Where do they come from? So, you know, when you look at everything and, and it's not, on the package, it doesn't say Angus, Charley, or any of that kind of stuff. It just says prime choice and where it's from, USA, or wherever it is. And so when you look at progressing your association, I think there's a lot of, a lot of plus side to it. Um, but when I look at it and I think of where is the biggest benefit, it's what you have and how it's marketing to fit the industry's needs. And for me, that is a simple fact, is if you can stretch this Charlay associate stretch that breed through the summer months as I think there's a lot, and I don't know a lot of guys, they love Charlays. I mean, there's time, there, you know, when you get kind of in that spring, you know, there's a sale of Charlays. They might be 10 bucks higher than anything else. While they know going through the summer, guess what? They handle the heat. And so, um, the, the wing, the, you know, I know the, the birthing weight and all those kind of things, but when you look at the end product, and, and the performance and all that is, you know, over the last six years, I've seen tremendous improvements. Uh, I hope they continue to be there. The, the, the carcass weight, and like I said, I, I know there's, there's a, I'm gonna put him on the spot, John on the spot for a minute, but I know there's strict restrictions, right? Is you can only get them so big, but my, the last five years, that's what I've sit there and thought about, is how, because everybody gets 1,600, 1,700 pounds to get the most meat, but, 
for me, is that was one thing I did with the Charlays more than anything, was if I could get a thousand pound carcass at 1,400 pounds versus 1,600 pounds, how do I do it? Because it just benefits us, the Charlay Association because you know you can pull them up and get them there and get, and get the prime choice. You don't have the fours and fives. So that's what I really focused on. I was making pretty good headway uh, getting there because th that's the piece of it is you can pull them up pretty good. And they do put the, and I think John's going to talk about it a little bit, is the carcass, and like I said, minimal, minimal fours and fives, and that's a huge thing you have going. I would say one of the biggest things is just getting the prime choice in them a little harder, whatever that looks like with the association. And then the programs is getting more of them on it. I mean, it's, uh, you know, the smoky shard, I think, would fit the, what is it, you said 51%, the SCAB, you're not that far away from it. So, questions? Questions? So, Rick, specifically, any areas as breeders that we need to be aware of to try to continue to improve upon? Obviously, things are, are heading in the right direction, but from a cattle breeder's perspective, <coughs> are there any specific things that, that you'd like to see in that genetic package as, as those genetics come to the No, I think the biggest one for me was just, I mean, if a guy can get that choice in him a little quicker, uh, like I said, it is a luxury you can push on because there is times you push, but it's really hard to pull them because you are going to lose a little bit of grade. Uh, so as a breeder standpoint, and what that looks like, I don't know. But if you could get that a little more of that Angus, like I said, you know, 51% of the hit CAB, uh, to me, isn't that far off from what I've seen. Uh, you know, and I don't know what bulls in the Charlotte go back to that the most uh, you know, I think, if I'm not mistaken, when I went through some pedigrees, uh, and I actually talked to Brent Thill a couple times about it, is anything I fed that had Wyoming wind, which I don't know much about him, but I had a higher choice out of that bull. Now, like I said, I don't know much about it, but as I researched it, trying to get to that point, there's a lot of the, because I did feed some other ones, I seem to have a higher percentage of choice out of anything that went back to his bloodlines. So for me, it would be just getting those bulls and trying to get as much data. If you sell your calves to somebody and ask them, can I get the data back? That's the hardest piece uh, for guys to keep them separate. So that they can, when they sell them and they kill them, is you can get that data back because it only helps you build on them. Like I said, five to seven years is what I've been doing. And really, really focusing on it. Uh, so as you progress, and then when you get into the program cattle, I think you can get that data back. But I would say just getting whatever percentage you need mixture to get your choice a little quicker. Because you know you're gonna have the carcass, the minimal, and I don't think it would affect your fours and fives, honestly, that much, but it would just be if you did ship them low early, instead of maybe the low 80s, you could be close to the 90s. So, Judd, uh what would be the ideal time for you to buy cattle? Um, Charlotte cross cattle that you feed through the summer. When would you and what kind of weight back up for the cattle? Which? Well, I, th I think, you know, if you bought a, you know, six or seven week, February, March, you'll go through the summer. Because the biggest thing, too, is they need to finish from right in the fall. And so I think, you know, that end of February, March, period of six to seven weight, you get 180 days. Or, well, you know, on a set, well, heifer would be a little different, but uh, on a steer. But that period, that weight of cattle, you could go through the summer, they're going to finish in the fall, due to weather, it's not so hot, would be ideal. And like I said, I know a lot of, you know, a lot of the calves I bought, 575 to 685 in October. So, you know, by the time I got, I mean, I was marking them in May and June. So you put an extra couple of months on them carrying through July and August, uh, finishing in September, get that cooter. And you know, of course, I can't speak for every region, but just Colorado and some of these other areas, is it just it starts cooling off and they finish very well. Some of the calves I did get seven weeks in April and they did tremendous through the summer. And then like I said, finished them in a little bit cooler weather and they just, I mean, they popped. It was incredible. Other questions from the audience out there? Right? Go ahead, go for it. <clears throat> yeah, I'm a you know, cow-calf producer. 
I mean, I sell my calves, you know, off the cow in the fall. The question is, you know, should I implant those calves, you know, young or or not implant them? Some buyers prefer, you know, non-implanted, you know, calves. I guess what what's your take on it? I want I want your opinion. So my take on it was I never like. I mean, for me, is I would tell people not to implant them because once I got them, is I could put the pop on them. Uh, and then that can went, you know, even if somebody weaned them, same thing as I would, and a lot of guys I've worked with wouldn't implant them because I want your calf when I get it and I sell it to pop. That way you can tell your neighbor, here's what my calf did. And I'll share, I mean, I'll share the information with you. If they did a five, i tell you they did a five. But, it, as, and like I said, growing up in a grow yard is, you know, everybody, <clears throat> so if they got an implant, when they're a calf, and then they got the implant when they got weaned or turned out, and then say they did get to a year, and then I put another implant into them. So each step of it, it kind of slows them down because you're growing them, then you're growing them. So for me, personally, and this is, I, I wouldn't want an implant. I think the non, and for the, a lot of the programs is, uh, uh, they don't, you, you can't implant them. I, and I think that you're better off not doing it. I understand weight pays. Uh, Guys want the pounds, but put the pounds on the last, you know, the last 180 days because they do it. And a lot of the, you know, and I run a lot of head-to-head -head comparisons, not trials, just studies I did. And calves I knew that were implanted versus non-implanted, it was probably a three to five tenths difference in gain, and the conversion was the same. Uh, just because I was getting to do everything with them, and if I screwed them up, it was my fault. But um, implanting them. Like I said, you kind of help them grow a little bit. Well, I understand that. Um, but also, is if you let nature do its course and then I finish them off with an implant or two implants, whatever it may be, is I can really make them pop. So I would tell you for me is, I mean, like I said, I, I still bought calves that had implants as long as they had the shop requirements. I still did it. But just running a lot of comparisons uh, on, on all breeds is the non-implant and it's always out there the other ones on calves. I would maybe mention with the, you know the powerful genetics that the Charlotte breed has. I don't know if it pays to implant anymore. And by implanting you've closed the door on these programs that you know Cole discussed with you as far as your NHTCs and your naturals, you're out. So you're you know you're, you're, you got a one way road. Uh, next question. Yes. Great. What's your perception on um, conversion of feed efficiency rate of Charlays versus versus other breeds? Or <coughs> Some of the best I've had been from Charlays, uh, but like I said, it's once they hit to the feed lot, it depends on what they do with them. Uh, so, but some of the best I've had, I mean, I've had some. Pretty good Angus cattle too, uh, but the, the the gain and the conversion, even cost of gains, have hung right with the best of them. But it was it was some of them. I mean, they were non-implanted. Uh, I've actually got some weaned heifers uh, before, no implants, <coughs> just outdid everything I ever got. Uh, but it's also, like I said, the biggest thing is how we feed them. Right is. You can do everything right on the cat, the brand side of it, and we can screw them up in the feed yard. And that, I mean, and that doesn't go. I mean, that, and the bad part about it is, is it doesn't go back to the cow calf, which a lot of it sometimes does. But it takes one hic hiccup, and you know, and they're, we screw them up. Well, you don't want to, you know, a lot of guys. Well, I don't want to buy them calves again. But if you look at the whole scenario, okay, what did we do wrong? And, and that was my whole philosophy: is I wanted the best out of all of them. And, some of these little studies I did, we had to be accurate 100% of the time. And so that was mine, was could I get, and my biggest thing was pushing heifers, is could I get them to perform like a steer? Uh, like I said, I've been feeding cattle for 40 years, and I've always, you know, everybody hated heifers. They come in and get them out of 11, 50, 1200 pounds. And, my, and I actually didn't feed them for a couple of years, and I asked myself, why? Why can we not feed them? And so I just started working on that. And so my goal was to get the gain conversion and all that equal, and we were getting pretty close. Uh, but honestly, it's just 
and, and it depends on the grass too. I mean, I've had a lot of calves come in off grass, go belly. The, you know, I mean, you got to work at it, but I can get them to perform. Uh, you know, this year, same thing. There's a lot of grass everywhere. It's going to be interesting to see how cattle do coming off some of this grass. But realistically, is they they'll hang with the best of them if you feed them. 